Chris. This is Black Hawk Down, the Bagel, the Battle, the Bagel, the Battle of Mogadishu, 1993, Part Two. And I mean, I already did Part One, so video. This video is sponsored by Conflict of Nations, a free online player versus player strategy game where you can lead your nation in a modern day global conflict. Set in the present day country and start fighting your way to victory. This is the operations room by the way. Romeo 64, this is Uniform 64. We've got a lot of vehicles that will be almost impossible to move, quite a few casualties. Getting to the crash site will be awful tough, pinned down. Uniform 64, this is Romeo 64. Danny, I really need you to get to that crash site. This is Uniform 64. I have numerous casualties, vehicles that are halfway running. Gotta get these casualties out of here ASAP. The convoy, lost in the city and sustaining heavy casualties, heads back to the airport, with Sergeant Eversman and most of Chalk 4 aboard. The quick reaction force of 12 Humvees has tried to fight its way back into the city, but is ambushed en route and also returns to the airport. The Rangers and Delta operators besieged at the first crash site will have to fight on into the night. The Delta and Rangers have become mixed together during their fight to the first crash site. Ranger Sergeants Williamson and Goodell, Lieutenant Lechner and Privates Nethery and Errico have been hit en route and Delta Sergeant Fillmore has been killed with a shot to the head. Throughout the fight to the crash site, the more experienced Delta boys offer reassurance and guidance to the younger, inexperienced Rangers but those who witness Fillmore's death are shaken. In the eyes of the younger of the Rangers, the Delta Force guys are supermen. They aren't supposed to get killed. We must be in trouble. The rescue teams are frantically trying to remove- That's gotta put some fear into you. When you're looking at guys who you're like, oh my god, good, they're here. And you see one of them go down, you gotta think, oh no. Because if you're looking at them like Superman and Superman gets wounded, you start questioning your own safety. The wounded and bodies of the remaining crew of downed Super 6 1, but the crash has crumpled the aircraft around them, and it will take many hours to cut them free. They first stabilize semi conscious left side gunner Dowdy, believing that the convoy will be here shortly to evacuate him. A hail of fire punches holes through the aircraft's thin skin, and medics Mabry and Wilkinson both take hits to the hands. Despite this, and not wanting to move Dowdy from the aircraft under fire through the topside, they dig a tunnel out from under the aircraft, dragging Dowdy to a nearby building. The Rangers and Delta teams arrive at Marahan Road, a southerly road going uphill away from the crash, and occupy buildings on its eastern side. The fighting is already desperate and close quarters, and the force takes more casualties. Ideally, the teams would move into a coherent perimeter around the crash, but Lieutenant Perino has no choice but to radio Ranger leader Captain Steele to inform him that his chalk is combat ineffective at their current location, with more wounded than can be carried. Captain Steele's group, further up the street, are also now rendered combat ineffective by the number of wounded. Steele sends a detachment across the street to improve their defensive perimeter. All teams will have to defend their positions until help arrives. At present, the men on the ground have no idea when that could be. Ranger Corporal Smith is hit on the street, and is dragged into a courtyard nearby. Trying to stem Smith's blood loss, Delta Medic Sergeant Smith tries desperately to save the 21-year-old's life. He requests an immediate helicopter evacuation, or the young man won't make it. Marahan Road is still too hot to land a helicopter, so the request is rejected. Lieutenant Perino watches on helplessly as Corporal Smith slips away. As day turns to dusk at 7.30pm, the 30 minute mission heads into its fourth hour, and the besieged rangers and d-boys are beginning to run short of ammunition, water and medical supplies. Yeah. The helicopters of the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment have been taking fire all day trying to hold the enemy back. Two aircraft have been shot down, two more have crash landed at the safe Newport area, and most of the others have taken small arms fire. General Garrison has no choice but to order Blackhawk Super 6-6, 
piloted by Chief Warrant Officers Wood and Fuller, to conduct a dangerous resupply mission. They approach the area and come to hover one block south of the crash site. With a large concentration of SNA militia below, attacking the US troops on the ground, a ferocious hail of fire begins to hit the helicopter. Bullet holes are being punched into the airframe around them, as the crewmen frantically push supply packages overboard to the street below. Super 66 hovers there for 30 very long seconds. Delta wow. Force Sergeant Zagadi, who had earlier jumped straight off of the returning lost Humvee convoy and straight into the Black Hawk to head back in to help his friends, takes a non-fatal hit to the face. Rounds tear into the engine and gearbox, but the Black Hawk holds its hover until all of the supplies have been shoved out of the door. Miraculously, Super 66 completes its resupply, and Wood and Fuller climb the helicopter out of the danger, nursing it back to the airport. The supplies- Man, you're lucky. I did see an RPG go by, I saw two. 30 seconds? I mean, that's plenty of time to lock on. These are distributed amongst the teams, but Steele's group are too isolated and don't receive any new ammunition. The AH-6 Littlebird attack helicopters now arrive to perform rocket and minigun runs against the Somalis surrounding the US ground forces. The SNA militia are now arriving with heavier truck-mounted machine guns and recoilless rifles. With the isolated US groups not able to form a coherent single perimeter, the risk of friendly fire is high. With the help of infrared strobes thrown by the troops on the ground at the enemy positions, the Little Birds rotate in to put down frequent fearsome gun runs on the SNA militia. As the night goes on, the Somali fire becomes less consistent, but a constant stream of reinforcements from across the city continues to arrive to fight. Back at headquarters, General Garrison, realising that the QRF Humvees won't be enough to rescue his troops, has called on the UN peacekeeping force of Pakistanis and Malaysians at the Newport area in the south of the city for aid. Not a quick reaction force, and having not been given warning of the raid, it is taking a few hours for the rescue column, armed with four M48 tanks and 32 Condor armoured personnel carriers, to mobilise for the rescue mission into the city. 10th Mountain QRF and Task Force Ranger Humvees arrive at the Newport Zone at around 10pm, and so begins a frustrating 90 minutes of planning and organisation. The rescue force finally departs the Newport area at 11.23pm and heads north into the city. American 10th Mountain Division troops, TFR and Malaysian troops have transferred onto the Malaysian APCs, crewed with Malaysian drivers and gunners. US 10th Mountain troops had initially expressed concern about the competence of their Malaysian counterparts, and that they should just hand over their armoured personnel carriers to the Americans. But given the day's events, voicing this to them may not have been particularly well received, no. and no such concerns were raised. The Pakistani tanks lead the column of 70 vehicles to National Street, where the Malaysian Condors will then spearhead the force into the city. The majority of the convoy will hold between the two crash sites, and elements will move to both sites to carry out the rescues. For the most part, only the officers speak English, so organising the route, radio comms and rules of engagement has taken time. 10th Mountain AH-1 Cobras are now arriving on station to provide a much needed relief for the Little Birds providing relentless air support to the ground forces. Maneuvering the armoured vehicles through the thin streets and alleyways isn't a good idea, so the convoy remains on the major roads as it navigates into the city. Their journey in is slowed by heavy fighting. While the APCs have some armour, the Humvees don't. RPGs flash towards them, and a rocket bounces off the hood of one Humvee. One of the transport trucks takes a disabling RPG hit, and the men on board scramble into nearby vehicles. Malaysian gunners pound nearby buildings with cannon fire to cover their movements. Despite the use of armour, the battle in is tough. I love how a peacekeeping force is using is using guns. <laughs> and slow for the two mile long convoy. A Malaysian soldier is killed when an RPG hits the lead condor. Seven more Malaysians and two Pakistanis are wounded during the fight into the city. The RPG hits and casualties cause further delay to the convoy. The Rangers and Delta besieged at Crash Site 1 continually radio in to the C2 bird, asking when the convoy will arrive. 40 minutes, they say. Then, 30 minutes later, another 40 minutes. Then 10 minutes, then 20 minutes, then simply soon. The men on the ground have no choice but to laugh at the erratic time estimates. With a healthy dose of eye-rolling, 
Any minute now becomes the standard response when the question is asked. The convoy arrives at its central assembly point on National Street and halts amid a continuing firefight. The vehicles of the leading half of the convoy take a right turn up Hordig Road and approach a roadblock just south of the target building that Rangers and Delta Force had landed on nine hours earlier. Again fearing bombs and mines planted inside the roadblock, the Condors can't simply drive through. 10th Mountain Troops dismount from the lead vehicles, some progressing on foot towards the first crash site, others dismantling the roadblock by hand. The convoy and dismounted soldiers fight block by block through the city in a constant battle with the SNA militia. 23-year-old 10th Mountain Private James Martin is killed as he moves through the city on foot. To the south, rescue forces arrive at Mike Durant's crash site too, but the crew are nowhere to be found. The Somali mob has carried the bodies of the dead crew members away, and Durant himself is under the captivity of Ideed. The ground forces secure sensitive material on board and prepare explosive charges to destroy the helicopter. With the roadblock clear, the convoy rolls eastward with dismounted troops alongside on the street. The C2 bird above calls the next left turn to the crash site. Ranger Captain Steele hears the approaching vehicles. In the darkness, he shouts, Rangers, Rangers. He cautiously peers out into the street. This is Captain Steele, I'm the Ranger Commander. Roger sir, we're from the 10th Mountain Division. Ten and a half hours after the first TFR boots landed in downtown Mogadishu, their rescue column has arrived. The Humvees and Condors reinforce the Ranger perimeter and quickly get to work helping to free Walcott's body from the downed chopper. The cockpit is lined with bulletproof Kevlar, so attempts to saw through to cut him free are fruitless. Using chains attached to the front and rear of the aircraft, the Humvees attempt to physically pull the airframe apart. The efforts take several hours and sunrise approaches. The Americans and Malaysians continue to hold off the city, with RPG rounds and vehicle-mounted heavy machine guns still battering them from all around. Wounded Sergeant Goodell in one of the Condors loses his cool and screams at the Malaysian drivers to get them out of here. No, no, we stay, comes the response in broken English, and the rescue force holds the line. An RPG ricochets off another Condor, and again the driver calms and reassures his American counterparts. With the sun rising, and after countless hours of effort under fire, the crew of Super 6-1 is rescued from the downed Blackhawk. At 5.45am, the cover of darkness no longer offers its protective blanket, and the vehicles finally begin to roll south to rejoin the others, holding on National Street and Hallwardig Road. There's a big problem, however. With the vehicles carrying dead and wounded on stretchers, there isn't enough room for all of the Rangers and Delta operators. They have no choice but to run the mile south to National Street on foot. The Humvees and Condors don't drive slowly enough for the men on the ground to use them as cover, and they find themselves alone. After now 14 hours of fighting, Captain Steele leads nine Rangers, all of the Delta Force operators, and the combat search and rescue team through the streets of Mogadishu. They put down covering fire as they dart across each intersection. In daylight, there's no point in being slow and cautious. It's a miracle that only one man takes a hit to the shoulder, but continues anyway. A loud explosion sends Ranger Medic Specialist Strauss flying into a nearby bush. Sergeant Watson grabs Private Floyd and asks, where the hell is Strauss? He blew up, Sergeant. He blew up? What the hell do you mean he blew up? He blew up. At that moment, Strauss picks himself up out of the bush, pointing to the burned hole in his vest where the flashbang grenade that had taken the round had been. They continue together. Finally, the exhausted men spot the column of APCs and Humvees waiting for them. Each now running on nothing but adrenaline, they collapse into the vehicles. The lone dash by the Rangers and D-Boys back to the convoy would become known as the Mogadishu Mile. With Pakistani tank support and with Pakistani troops dismounting to clear roadblocks, the convoy finally rolls out towards the Pakistani Military Health Stadium northeast of them at 6.20am. In the disastrous Battle of Mogadishu, one Malaysian, one Pakistani and 19 Americans have been killed or will die in hospital of their wounds, with a further 82 UN troops wounded and two helicopters shot down. What should have been a 160-man, 30-minute mission to snatch two of ID's top ministers becomes a 15-hour nightmare, requiring a rescue force of 3,000 UN troops with tanks and armoured personnel carriers. Estimates for Somalis killed vary between 315 and 2,000 killed including many civilians. 
Despite this, the engagement is an undoubted strategic victory for the underestimated SNA leader, Mohamed Farah Aidid. His strategy to shoot down a helicopter and then collapse the city around the rescue effort has been successfully executed, and will eventually result in US withdrawal from Somalia. While the political and military fallout would rage for the next months, there can be no doubt in the bravery shown by both sides in the battle. Two days later, amid public outcry over the event, President Bill Clinton orders a cessation of all operations against Saeed and appoints a new special envoy to Somalia to broker a peace settlement, announcing US troops would leave the country no later than March 1994. US Secretary of Defense Les Aspin steps down taking the blame for refusing requests for armored support to the mission in Somalia. General Garrison also takes full responsibility, effectively ending his military career. After 11 days in captivity, Durant is released, and the bodies of the remaining crew of Super 6-4 returned in poor condition. Five years later, on the 2nd of August 1996, Mohamed Farah Aidid dies of a heart attack, following a gunshot wound in a battle with a rival faction. The tragic civil war in Somalia continues today. Wow. Thanks again to our sponsor, Com I've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, but I haven't seen it in a while. Kind of makes me want to watch it again. So that's Black Hawk Down. The Operations Room. Good channel. I'm going to do more of their stuff. If you have any recommendations, throw them at me. And I'll do my best to get them in. I'll probably forget some of them, I'm sure. Um, like and subscribe to the channel. Otherwise, the guy who just did the voiceover will probably go on a murdering spree. So, you should like and subscribe to my channel. Help him out. I don't know what I'm hearing. Anyways, have a good day, have a good night.